Hello everyone, in this video we continue the discussion of some core aspects of my master's thesis. In the previous video we looked at the background of making a theory and defining a problem. In particular we looked at an example of how we can write a theory and that the math then leads to some certain Feynman diagrams. And this then leads to some phenomenology that we can then explore. We are looking to see if the phenomenology of the model is consistent with current observations of the universe. In this video we will look at some aspects of the theory that we can explore to see if the model can already be ruled out or if it's currently fitting inside current constraints. So stay tuned for that. Having written down some theories in the previous video, we can now move on to exploring the phenomenology of the theories. But before we move further, let me just clarify that I'm in no way the inventor of these theories. These models have been studied for years, but I've decided to study these models further because I believe that there is still more we can explore in these theories. Thus, while the theory might not be new, some details of the theory might not be fully understood and that is what I'm looking at. Now having said that, the first thing a theory trying to explain the dark matter problem should be able to do is have some mechanism for producing the dark matter that we observe. So the first question would be, can the model reproduce the dark matter that we measure? Or in physics terms, can we reproduce the dark matter relic density? Relic density refers to the fact that it was produced a long time ago. In the past decade, the Planck satellite has managed to do some quite precise measurements of our universe. From its measurement, we have determined that the dark matter relic density is around 0.12. So let us first figure out if this model can in any way produce enough dark matter, or if it's producing too much dark matter, that might be even more of a problem. The obvious mechanism for this model is the freeze-out mechanism, which is the same mechanism that is responsible for the relic densities of so many other particles. It works in a very simple way. You have a reaction or interaction between two different particles. Let's say you have two dark matter particles and two normal matter particles. Let's say you have two dark matter particles and two Higgs particles. The interaction can go both ways, backwards or forwards. It's a balance between dark matter and normal matter. At high temperatures, this process is in equilibrium and goes both ways. Eventually at lower temperatures, this process begins to favor one direction, and in this case it will favor the direction of the usual matter. At this point, the dark matter is simply annihilating into regular matter. Obviously, if this process continues for too long, we will just annihilate all the dark matter. The trick is that if the temperature falls even further, then this annihilation process also stops and thus we are left with some relic density of the dark matter that didn't annihilate because the temperature became too cold. This is why it's called the freeze-out process. Now depending on how efficient the annihilation before the freeze-out takes place is, we get some relic density dark matter. So we can calculate a lot of Feynman diagrams and try to figure out how much dark matter will be destroyed and how much will be left after freeze-out. And thus we can determine the dark matter relic density of the model. Computing a lot of math allows us to calculate the relic density of this model. And yes, spoiler alert, we can produce enough dark matter with this model. And as it turns out, this model only has two free parameters. So for convenience, I will be using the mass of the dark matter and the coupling, which is the coupling to the standard model as a parameter. On the graph you see a few different lines corresponding to different values of the coupling. We see that the lines do intersect with a dotted line indicating the 0.12 measured value. The upper line is for a smaller coupling and the lower lines represent a stronger coupling. Why is that? We recall that the dark matter density depends on how much dark matter survived the annihilation and reached the result of where annihilation stopped. If we have a stronger coupling, then we have more interaction and thus more annihilation, thus less dark matter would survive, and relic density would consequently be lower. 
Since density is mass per volume, it makes sense that increasing the dark matter mass would increase the dark matter relic density. So it is why we see that the line is growing with the mass. We don't know the real value for the mass or the coupling, but if we knew one of the values, we would know what the other value should be to fulfill the requirement of the relic density. So what does this mean? It means that we cannot exclude the model yet at least. The model could potentially work, but it might not work because of some other aspects that we haven't considered yet. The most important is probably that we are not overproducing dark matter, because if the relic density of the model will be too high, then in general it means that the model would be dead. Underproducing dark matter might not be such a big of an issue as it could be resolved by adding additional dark matter to the model. In this sense, overproducing is worse than underproducing. It however turns out that the model can produce the correct density as it is. This is just the first step of investigating the model. We can keep going. Can we find something that can prove this model wrong? If not, it's a good model. Let's investigate the model further. Detecting dark matter is notoriously difficult. It's kind of in the name, dark matter. We call it dark matter because we cannot see it. It's inherently hard to detect. But difficult doesn't mean impossible. Just because you turn off the light in your dining room, it doesn't mean that your dining table isn't there or the chairs are not there. It just means you cannot see them, but you can still feel them or hit them. In a similar way, we might be able to detect dark matter via some clever ways. According to the theory, the dark matter particles can interact with the quarks inside the protons and neutrons of atoms via the Higgs field. This leads us to direct detection where dark matter scatters off the proton or neutron of atoms. This process transfers energy to the proton or neutron and this we can measure. So if we can measure that something is hitting the atom at some specific energy, then this is a smoking gun and actually the atoms are being hit by dark matter particles. Recall that we expect that there are five times more dark matter than usual matter, so dark matter would be everywhere around us. So far, no experiments have been able to detect dark matter hitting atoms. So currently we have no evidence for dark matter via direct detections so far. But we're still looking and improving our instruments to be even more sensitive to the smallest possible signals. Now only time will tell if we can find something or not. It will however not be too long, because there is a physical limit on the practicality of these experiments. You might not expect why, but the enemy here is surprisingly the rather harmless neutrinos of the standard model. The neutrino can scatter off the quarks and protons and neutrons via the weak force mediated by the Z bosons. This interaction is extremely weak, but at some point our measurements will be so sensitive that we will be able to detect these very weak interactions. And the problem is, if we don't manage to detect dark matter before hitting this neutrino floor, then it will become impractical to ever detect dark matter via direct detection, at least with the current technology. The point where the neutrino signal begins to appear is called the neutrino floor, because it's a noise floor that basically makes it very hard to detect any other particles like dark matter particles. And this is due to the noise of the neutrino interactions. The picture is thus that the window between the current most sensitive results and the neutrino flow is closing. The models that we look at show that the dark matter could be in this closing gap between the current best sensitive results and the neutrino floor. The hope is that we will detect something in the coming years because we're getting really close to the neutrino floor. This video looked at some phenomenology that one can investigate for dark matter models. First, we check that we can reproduce the correct amount of dark matter, thus the correct relic density. Having made sure that the model can do that, we moved on to the possibility of detecting the dark matter via direct detection experiments. Here we find that it might be possible, but we should find it soon then, because otherwise the neutrino flaw will become an issue. So with that recap, I hope you liked the video. If you would like to support the channel, check out the link in the description. Other than that, you can like and subscribe. That helps to promote the videos. If you have any questions or suggestions, please put them in the comment section. 
Other than that, I hope to see you in the next video. Stay tuned.